Thank you all for joining us today. This is the third and final session of Remote Sensing for Monitoring Land Degradation and Sustainable Cities SDGs. My name is Amber McCullum, and I will be your presenter today along with multiple guest speakers. Um, this is a theme with our training so far. Um, we will have our colleagues from Conservation International that we have had um, the past two weeks. And we are also joined today by Dennis Monaki from UN Habitat. And he's going to discuss indicator 11.3.1 and the associated data needs. Um, and then we'll, we'll also be hearing from um, Alex, Monica, and Mariano um, about the Transnet Earth tool. Again, just as a reminder for this training, we have three one and a half hour sessions. So this is our final session today on July 23rd. And you only need to sign up for and attend one session per day. We have the English, English session and we have the Spanish session um, presented live. You can also find all of the webinar uh, recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment found on the course website shown here. We will have some time for questions at the end, but if your question doesn't get answered or you have a follow-up, feel free to email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez at our email addresses shown here. We have one homework for this training and the link is now available on the website so you can access the, that train, that, um, link to the Google form for the homework. In order to receive a certificate of completion, you must have attended three of the live webinars and complete the homework uh, two weeks from now um, by August 6th. And again, I me I've mentioned this the past two weeks, but the homework does span the entire training. So just be aware of that when you're answering the questions. Um, there'll be questions from sessions one, two, and three, and the associated exercises. You will receive your certificate of completion about two months after the end of this course. Um, so please do be patient uh, with receiving the certificate. It does take a while to process um, all of those. Again, I've mentioned the course prerequisites a fundamentals of remote sensing and having um, QGIS, the correct version of QGIS, and then installing, downloading, installing, and registering the Trends.Earth software. Um, and this is the plugin within QGIS um, that we have been going through exercises with and really demoing throughout the course of this training. Again, you can access all the course materials on the website shown here. And this includes the PowerPoint presentations, the um, recording that will be available a few days after each session, the exercise documents, and the homework link. So now that we are in the final session, we're really gonna shift our focus from SDG 15 to SDG 11. For today, I'll provide a very brief overview of SDG 11, and then we will hear from Dennis about indicator 11.3.1 uh, and the data needs. Then we'll also hear from our CI colleagues, and they will be providing a presentation on the Trends.Earth tool for SDG 11.3. 3.1, and then we'll be launching right into the exercise for urban mapping. So just as a reminder, today we're really going to focus on SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. Today, more than half the world's population live in cities. And by 2030, it's projected that six in 10 people will be urban dwellers. So cities are really important for uh, managing the SDGs and they can be really incubators for innovation and growth with um, drivers of sustainable development. 
With satellite imagery, we can map cities, especially urban areas. So this is a really great image of Landsat um, of the Los Angeles area. So you could see how we could use satellite imagery to map and identify urban land areas. The target 11.3 states that by 2030, enhance inclusive and sustainable urbanization and capacities for participatory, integrated, and sustainable human settlement planning and management in all countries. This is really a multifaceted target with many data needs. However, some of these data needs can be addressed via remote sensing. So like the images I've provided of urban mapping. The ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate is indicator 11.3.1. This indicator requires defining the two components of population growth and land consumption rate. In estimating the land consumption rate, you need to first define what constitutes consumption. And it might be really difficult to distinguish a newly developed region to a partially redeveloped region. Therefore, the percentage of current total urban land that was newly developed or consumed is used as a measure for this land consumption rate. Fully developed areas are sometimes referred to as built up areas. And again, things like Landsat are great tools for estimating um, these regions. Landsat with its 30 meter spatial resolution um, can be really uh, helpful here. And these images are um, really great. They're both from Landsat. Um, they are images of New Delhi from 1989 on the left and from 2018 on the right. And so you can really see this expansion of the city. So the city is shown in the purple hues and the gray hues, and then the um, countryside is shown in the light browns and green colors. And so you could see really how this city has expanded um, over the course of these years. In terms of data needs, the satellite images, primarily Landsat or Sentinel, can be used to estimate the impervious index or the built up area and the city extent. This needs to then be coupled with population data. It's also important to highlight good practice guidelines and the country reporting. Um, and this is another great image uh, of the nighttime lights. And this is an image from the VIRS um, sensor that allows you to identify urban areas as well. The UN Development Program is one of the many groups focused on target 11.3. And here are a few impressive statistics um, about urban areas. And um, one is that the fact that 4.2 billion people live in cities and that by 2050 that it's expected to reach 6.5 billion. While cities only occupy 3% of the area of Earth and there are 828 million people living in really poor conditions. So this is a, an important aspect of the SDGs. UN Habitat focuses on some of the same issues, where in over 90 countries, they promote the development of socially and environmentally sustainable human settlements and strive for adequate shelter with better living standards for all. And our guest speaker today will speak a, a little bit about UN Habitat and the data needs for this target. So again, I um, am happy to hand it over this week to our guest speakers. Um, first, we're gonna hear from Dennis Monike from UN Habitat. And then again, we're going to hear from our colleagues with Conservation International. So I will hand it over to our guest speakers at this point. Thank you very much, Amber, for the introduction. Um, my name is Dennis Monike. I work in the, the Global Urban Observatory Unit at TN Habitat, that uh, is, is the statistics unit of, of the agency. And I've been involved a lot with the, uh, the SDS monitoring. 
with specific focus on monitoring of uh, the indicators that require the use of other observations and geospatial information for, for computation. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, in the next few minutes about uh, the work that uh, needs to be done or the inputs uh, and the requirements for the computation of indicator 1131 that uh, Amber has already introduced. And uh, I'd just like to show a few things that happen in that happen in cities. Uh, cities usually change. They, 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 they evolve. They're like organisms which change over time. So they, some of them expand, some of them contract, uh, some of them densify, others just uh, sprawl outwards. So we have four ways in which cities uh, generally grow. Uh, cities in field where we have uh, growth happening within the same area. Uh, like, for example, a good example is uh, this case of uh, Oyakil in, in, in Ecuador, where we have, uh, if you look at this set, small section in green here, uh, we have this part of this part of the city that was uh, not very dense in 2003, but in the next uh, uh, year, that is 2015, there was a lot of development that had happened in this uh, same same section. At the same time, this uh, this city was also expanding outwards. Uh, if you look at the, the the circle to the left here, we have a uh, Wayakil and actually not just uh, in field or densified in some section, but it also grown outwards. Uh, so there was a lot of growth happening in in this part, uh, the, the top, uh, the the most uh, left side of of, of this uh, image. So we also have other kinds of growth where we have leapfrogging, where city jumps uh, uh, from from the traditional bond, or rather from from the original boundaries and starts to grow in in a new area. Then over time, uh, then the growth of the entire city joins into that uh, leapfrog leapfrog development. So all these kind of uh, uh, developments or ways of of change actually affect a lot how cities and urban settlements grow over time. For indicator 1131, as Amber has already mentioned, it measures the rate at which uh, the cities are expanding spatially versus the rate at which their population is growing. So traditionally, what we've uh, measured and what is presented a lot in the, the urban projections, so look at the population projections by the United Nations uh, Statistical Commission uh, Division, is uh, we have a lot of population projections, say a city like uh, Quito, would, would be having a growth uh, rate of say 4% or 10%. So this growth is has traditionally mostly been based on the population growth aspects. So what we're doing now for the SDGs is introducing a new measurement dimension that is also trying to look at where this growth is actually happening. So if you say a city or uh, the urban areas in a country grew by 10%, then uh, usually you don't know where this growth is happening. Whether it's uh, in the big cities, in the small cities, uh, or in, in coastal cities, and so on and so forth. So for this for this particular measurement or this indicator, it does not just look at the entire what is happening in the population changes or trends in, in a country, but also look at very specific uh, urban settlement changes over time. Uh, to, for this indicator, usually to, to be able to see change, uh, unless it's very fast-growing cities, uh, the recommended the interval is, is five years because one, the inputs that uh, are, are open source uh, currently will not, uh, if you don't have very high, very high resolution image, for example, you'll not be able to see the changes, very small changes over time. But when you have, say, you're using Landsat uh, imagery, then you are, you, when you have five years difference, you're likely to see a bit of a bit of growth in that city. So, for example, in this case again for our Achilles, that's why we are looking at 12 years difference here, and we can very clearly see uh, the the transitions. So, for this indicator, we have a different uh, kind of inputs to be able to to measure uh, the growth of of, of cities, uh, and uh, here we are showing uh, three three images. The first one shows the built up area change. The second one shows the, how this affects the boundaries and the third one shows the integration of population. I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, each of these uh, inputs uh, uh, one by one. So what we need is to measure two uh, kind of growth. The first one is what's called the land consumption rate. 
And this one looks at uh, how cities are actually expanding. And in the core indicator we have, uh, the way we measure this is looking at the outward growth of cities. So in the case of Riyadh here in the first, uh, in the first drawing, uh, or rather the first map is the black, the black spots here represent the built up areas of uh, Riyadh in the year 1990. Uh, then the blue is uh, the, the built up areas for Riyadh in 2000. And the red is the built up areas for Riyadh in 2013. So as we can see from this, uh, this, this, this map here, Riyadh grew very, over, over the period of uh, 23 years, Riyadh grew significantly from a small compact city to a city that is expands outwards in, into all directions with a lot of growth happening uh, to, to the north, towards the north, the north side. So for this indicator, what we are looking at is how is this city growing? Uh, especially and, and to do this then we need we need the, an input on the the built up area or the built up layer of the cities so so it's, it, this is a simple is a simple input that uh, i know mariano and alex are, are going to discuss in the subsequent uh, uh, slides on how the trends are is helping with this so we extract the built up layer for cities uh, and this uh, traditionally can be done by uh, normal image classification uh, procedures in, in GIS to extract uh, what was built up in, in this city uh, over, um, the, during the different time periods. So once we have this, then we need to define what we call the dynamic and uh, functional urban areas. And this is based more on the, the non-administrative functions of cities. So here we look at uh, uh, specific things that affect how the city functions. And one of them is the key, the key input to this is the growth. So when, when, when an area is growing very fast and is connected to the city, then this area is functionally likely to be more connected to the city than uh, despite the fact that in many cases it might be outside the official city boundary. So for this particular indicator, uh, we look beyond what is uh, the, within the, that context known as the official city boundary because the, the, uh, the state, the functioning of that city uh, is not really restricted to that administrative uh, aspect. So in the case of Riyadh, for example, uh, if, if uh, the boundary of this city was around the black uh, areas in, in the, the year 1990, then if you kept that boundary as a fixed boundary, it would mean that as the city grows outwards, then you are not really capturing the growth. So for this particular indicator, we are looking at the entire spectrum of, 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 of urban, urban level growth uh, that uh, defines uh, what the city is. So this is one of the, just an example of, uh, of, of, of yeah, this does not represent the official, the, the second map here in the middle, does not represent the official uh, classification of what is, what is Riyadh. In, in the different years, but rather the, uh, an analysis of uh, the urban extent uh, function of this city based on the built up area density, which uh, this is defined by looking at uh, within every one square kilometer of land, how much built up area is for every single, uh, every single built up uh, one, one square kilometer circle. And for this one, what we, what we pick is if, uh, from every built up pixel uh, and within the one square kilometer circle, we have more than 25% of the area also built up, then that qualifies to, to be an urban area. And that is how this uh, boundary is here in the middle, the, the, the map in the middle have been generated just by analyzing the built up area density for, for this city, the different, uh, the different years. What is important to pick here is we're looking at not uh, Riyadh, not just as, uh, as, a, as an administrative area, but picking all the built up areas where buildings happened within this uh, time period. And we are, we are using that to define what is uh, the functionally called, uh, functionally would be like a city area for this particular. And this includes uh, clusters of uh, settlements that were very well connected all around, around the, main, the main urban, urban center. So this, we use this to create uh, the dynamic boundaries, then we can, from this, we can actually be able to see the change of, of this city 
uh, in the different periods, then that is what you use to compute the land consumption uh, rate component. And the land consumption component of, of the indicator is measured basically by looking at the, the natural logarithm of uh, the built up, uh, the, the urban extent here in, in, for example, here would be the, the for, for the year 2000, here would be what is in yellow in this map in the middle. Uh, that would be the area of the of this city of Riyadh in the year 2000. Then what is in blue inside the yellow ones is what would have been the area of the Riyadh, the, the function, the, the dynamic boundary of Riyadh in the year 1990. So basically we'll be looking at that growth between the, bon the area of 1990 and the area of 2000 and uh, using the natural logarithm and the annualizing of, of this kind of growth so that you get an annual uh, growth. In essence, what we get from this is, we'll be able to say, uh, Riyadh grew by say 0.1% over the, over the 10 years between uh, 1990 and 2000, then that would be an annual, an annual growth to the other. The third component that is very important then is also to look at the population change. So if, if in the middle here we look at uh, how the city is growing spatially, but then we also need to see how the population is changing against this uh, boundary that we have defined. Uh, what this means is we need to look at inside every boundary that we've created here using the built up uh, area and, and estimate how many people are living within that area. Uh, the best way of doing this is uh, going to the national statistic offices and asking them to tell us because they have very high resolution data at the household level and look at for the years of analysis and look at the, tell us how many people are actually living within the, those boundaries in that particular year then we use that then to uh, to compute the population growth rate uh, over that period but again this information is very difficult to get in, in some countries or, uh, because of some of the years of analysis some of them will not be directly aligned to the statistic uh, the national censuses so what happens is uh, there have been different data sets that have been produced at the global level they call the gridded population uh, data set uh, and this what they what these data sets do is uh, they look at the area of say the an, a census unit they look within that census unit uh, how many people are likely to be there and to distribute this requires uh, different inputs so I, i'll just say talk about one of the ones that is uh, uh, the most common one that looks at how many buildings uh, are within a census unit and distributes population to all of them so the, the logic here is uh, as opposed to treating a population density by distributing the entire population to the area well, in actual, that uh, census unit might contain a national park or it might contain a water body. Uh, then what we're doing is we're actually saying within this enumeration area or this census unit, people only live in buildings. So people should actually be counted as, uh, as, as a share of, of how many buildings there are in that, in that, uh, in that unit. So this is how uh, different uh, population uh, grid uh, data sets have been created and, and we have a lot of them, uh, the grid population of the world is different versions. I think the current one is version four. We have the global human settlement layer population, we have the world population. So basically using these data sets then we are able to look at inside each uh, boundary that we created, the dynamic boundary that we created in uh, the middle uh, map here, then we look for each year uh, how many people are uh, estimated, how many people are living within this area. Then we use this to then uh, compute the compute the, 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 the share of the, uh, the, the indicator aspect of the population growth rate. So from this, then uh, we are able once once we once we have this, then we, it's, it's straightforward. We measure the land the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate, which is 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 measured as just by dividing the the value we have for the land consumption rate by the value for the population growth rate. And this information is very really useful for cities and for national governments because of many things. Uh, the first one that uh, I'd like uh, to 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 mention is. It helps cities understand their growth beyond the administrative boundary. So, for example, if the, 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 the two mayors who uh, whose cities are next to each other, and a lot of growth is happening in one city and spreading to the other one, then it's only 
it's only important that these two mayors understand what kind of growth is happening and how they can collaborate and work together to uh, for regional development as opposed to just uh, people focusing or, or decision makers focusing on the same area. So this indicator helps us to want to understand how cities are growing, how fast they're growing, which direction they're growing, uh, the kind of growth that is also happening. Is, is, it, is it too dense? Is it uh, uh, this past uh, kind, of, kind of growth? And all this, again, help to determine uh, service, the need for services uh, and, and where investments are needed in that city. They help to support development of policies and sustainable urbanization, as I mentioned, because if, if for example, a city is growing uh, too fast into agricultural land, then this indicator will help us to understand. And uh, an important thing to note beyond what the, the core indicator requires is that uh, the information produced by computing this figure of uh, land consumption rate to population growth it is not enough for, for, for the entire decision making uh, process. Uh, we require a bit more information on the, what is actually the kind of growth that is happening and, and this is very easy to produce this information just from the same inputs that we, we, have, we are going to generate in the next slide uh, through the trends actual. Uh, one of the important ones would be to look at say when the city is growing outwards, which types of land uses is it eating into? So is it, is this, are, the, is, are the cities growing more into agricultural land? Are they growing into water? Are they growing to desert land? And so on and so forth. And, and using the exact same inputs that I've explained, the, the built up area change and defining the, the dynamic boundaries that we can very easily be able to determine this. The second aspect that we can also look from this and that helps also in decision making processes is how how fast are the cities also densifying inside. So if, for example, we have uh, the main city area or the, the city border is say in the year 1990, they were showing for the case of here, then we'll be able to see within 1990 how much uh, change happened within the 1990 area. So we can we can actually calculate how fast the city is densifying vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis how, how fast the city is uh, sprawling or is expanding outwards. And all this uh, this information is very useful because then it, 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 it plays more into the decision making process uh, more solidly than does in having a value of, of the indicator. Uh, a lot of a lot of people keep asking what the indicator means or the values. What what are the values uh, for the, the indicator supposed to supposed to mean? And uh, I I want to point out that the the, the values uh, really vary a lot depending on how you want to look at it. So, for example, a city that is uh, that is growing very fast outwards. The, the 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 target might be to reduce sprawl and uh, promote more densification, but a city that is densifying very fast, the risk might also be you 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 creating an informal settlements. So so here is, is not about having one figure that is a good number, but rather looking at this indicator value against uh, most of the other what is also happening internally. I'll give a good example. If you have a uh, growth rate, land consumption rate, population growth rate figure that is equal to one, what it would mean uh, literally is that every time new people come to the city, then the city is also growing outwards. You'd ask, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? It will depend because if, if the city is a, if the city is a very big city and is already too dense, then it might be a good thing. But when you have a uh, a small city that is expanding very, very fast outwards. Every time, like new people come to the city, then it is so grow. Then it's a bad thing because it affects a lot the service delivery for this uh, for this uh, area. And uh, again, this applies to all cities. So it, it's a matter of balancing between not just the land consumption rate to population growth rate, but also seeing what is happening within that uh, that uh, side of the city. Uh, another example is if we have a land consumption rate to population growth rate value that is say 0 0.5, that it's like half, uh, half of one. Then what this means is that this city is densifying very fast. There's very little uh, expansion happening outside. So the question here would be, is the densification uh, formal or is it informal? How is it affecting the service delivery? Is it is it resulting in congestion of services for for the people? Is it is it resulting in uh, say uh, 
uh, lack of, of people eating into open spaces in this city and, and so on and so forth. The last one is when you have the city, the, the, the land consumption to population growth rate value being so high, then the problem here would be how fast is, is this city growing? Is it is, is it is the growth happening at the same rate as the, that of the service provision? Is it just the external, the kind of extensions of the city affecting how, say, people commute to the city and so on and so forth? So in conclusion for this indicator, what you look at is it's not a single number of a value, but rather how this number is also relating to other aspects of the indicator. And, and this, this is very important because then it helps the decision making uh, process. Uh, the last thing here where also this indicator is important is uh, because when, when you understand where growth is happening, uh, there's a very high likelihood that you can assess uh, the vulnerability or the, say, developments in uh, uh, environmentally fragile areas. It helps you to make put in place uh, policies and plans to actually control this kind of growth to where, where this is applicable. But more importantly, this indicator is very key to to the entire urban understanding because it helps us move from understanding urban growth from a population, just a population based uh, kind of perspective to actually being able to show the mayor or to show the, the, the governance structure of, 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 of our entire urban system that growth is happening in these cities uh, very fast versus growth is happening uh, in, in, in other cities uh, very slowly. And, and one of the the thing that from UN Habitat these past uh, 10 years we've noticed is that, or we've, 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 we've found out is that uh, the smaller cities have been growing very fast as, as outwards as compared to bigger cities. But this, uh, from now our understanding of more data based on this indicator computation, we're also seeing a lot of growth happening in the, in the big cities because they're also expanding outwards very fast. So with this kind of with this kind of data from this indicator, then we are able to actually understand better the urban system of, of our countries, and also put in place the, uh, the data informed uh, policies and decisions that then uh, help us shape whether to our, our urban agenda, whether to densify some cities and whether to allow for a bit of uh, suburbanization of some areas. And with this uh, few remarks, I would like to welcome Alex, who is going to take us through a bit on, on the Trends Earth uh, tool. And from that, we'll uh, we'll be happy to answer any specific questions related to, to these uh, few slides that I've uh, talked about. Thank you very much for your uh, questions and for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for the introduction. I Again, my name is Alex Wallaf. I'm Senior Director of Resilient Science at Conservation International. And today, uh, as you've already heard, I'm going to talk to you about how to use the Trends.Earth tool to calculate SDG indicator 11.3.1 uh, in support of the Sustainable Cities SDG. So again, this is review. You've already heard about this uh, before from Dennis and Amber, uh, but the goal for SDG 11.3 is to make cities and human supplements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Uh, so to uh, calculate whether or not this SDG has been achieved, uh, the international community has agreed on an indicator. That's indicator 11.3.1, which is the ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. So in order to calculate this SDG, there's two different things that we need. Uh, the first is a data set on urban extent, and the second is a population data set so that we can calculate this ratio of the land consumption rate to population growth rate. So how do we actually get there to calculate uh, this SDG? Uh, so the first part, of course, is estimating the population growth rate. Uh, so what you see here on the right-hand side of your screen are the equations that are actually used uh, to calculate the SDG. Uh, so the population growth rate is calculated as the natural log, uh, as the population at time t plus 1 over the population at time t, so uh, some future population, say 2015, uh, divided by the population in, for example, 2010, if you were calculating the indicator over that period. And then uh, the second part is calculating the land use consumption rate. Uh, so that's the natural log of uh, the urban extent at time t plus one over the urban extent at time t. Uh, so then at the end of the day, we can actually calculate the final indicator, which is the ratio of these two things. It's the ratio of the uh, land consumption rate over the population 
growth rate. So how can we use remote sensing in, in order to support calculation of this SDG? Uh, well, a key part of this indicator, of course, is calculating the land consumption rate. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today is how we can use the trends.earth tool uh, to calculate the land consumption rate uh, using uh, remotely sensed imagery. The second piece of the picture, of course, uh, is population. And what we'll use today and what's uh, used in the trends.earth tool is the gridded population of the world uh, version 4 data set, which you might have heard referred to as the GPW version 4. Uh, so this is uh, available out of season. Uh, and this data set uh, uses a uh, census data set, uh, which is then allocated uh, to a raster grid. Uh, using methods developed uh, by the group at season. Uh, so there's something to note about uh, mapping uh, population growth rates using gridded uh, products is that this can be complicated due to changes in census units uh, over time. So it's very important to review uh, the data sets for the particular area in which you're working uh, as you can get uh, biases in your population growth rates uh, due to changes over time and census units. So this is something to be aware of. Uh, it's uh, not a problem in the underlying data set. It's just a problem with the fact uh, that uh, it's difficult to map changes in population over time, uh, given particularly as cities, for example, develop. Uh, there are many cases around the world in which census units will change or subdivide uh, over time. Uh, so we do always recommend if there is a uh, national uh, level uh, data available, for example, from the uh, Bureau of Statistics uh, for your country, we would recommend uh, using whatever the best available data is that you can uh, glean uh, for the particular area in which you're working. So how do we actually calculate uh, SDG 1131 uh, in trends.earth? So I'm going to go into this in a bit more detail in a second, but just to give you an overview of how the process works. Uh, so say, for example, we're looking at the first point in time that we support, which is the year 2000. Uh, the first step is to use satellite imagery. We use data from the Landsat archive uh, to calculate uh, an impervious surface index. So this is an index uh, giving an indication of the extent of impervious coverage uh, within a pixel. Uh, the next step is to convert from that impervious index into a map of built up areas. So these are areas uh, that are built up, uh, typically densest, of course, in the core of the city. Uh, you'll have less dense uh, built up extent typically on the outside, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the next step is to convert from just that simple map of built up area into actually making a map of the extent of a city, recognizing that, of course, you will have cases where uh, built up areas occur outside of a city. So there needs to be a conversion made from just that simple map of built up area to what's actually defined as a city. And then the next step is to combine that with population data uh, so that we can actually start to get at uh, the land consumption rate versus uh, the population growth rate. Of course, we don't have any rates yet. We're just looking at one single point in time for the year 2000. Once we start to bring in data uh, from additional periods, for example, 2005, we can start to actually get at the uh, rate of change of population and rate of change of land consumption in order to actually map uh, SDG 11.3.1. What we support in the tool is we allow this uh, to occur for multiple periods for 2000, for 2005, uh, for 2010, and also for uh, 2015. So using the tool, you can track changes uh, between uh, these four time points over time, getting three measures of SDG 11.3.1. So now we're going to start to get into a bit more detail of how this process actually works. Uh, so what we'll talk about in a minute is how we actually map built up area within a city uh, using the tool. So the first step uh, is to calculate uh, from a stack of satellite images of Landsat data, uh, this impervious surface uh, index. In a moment, I'll go into a bit more detail how we actually calculate that index, uh, but just know that this first step is actually pre-computed. So this isn't something you'll need to worry about directly when you're using the tool. Uh, you'll be working with uh, pre-computed uh, impervious surface index maps, uh, which then you'll be converting uh, into uh, the maps of city extent using the options uh, within the tool. 
So this is that second step, is using those pre-computed maps of impervious surface index. The tool will allow you to set a number of different parameters uh, to convert from these maps of built up area into an actual map of city extent. So I'll talk in a bit more detail about these in a second. But the idea here is rather than producing a single flow up global map of city extents all around the world, uh, what Trends.Earth does is it allows you to produce a map customized for your particular area. Uh, and this is important because, of course, as we all know, in any global product, it can be uh, very difficult to arrive at a single approach that will work universally around the world, particularly with something like cities where there's large regional variation and even variation uh, within a country uh, on the uh, size of cities, how cities are defined, et cetera. So what we do within Trends.Earth is we allow users uh, to set a number of parameters to map uh, a representation of city extent that makes sense for their given context. The final step then is to combine uh, these maps of built up area uh, with uh, global data on population, which as I've mentioned before, comes by default uh, from the gridded population of the world version four, the GPW v4 uh, data product. There's also the option uh, within the tool to use locally available population data, which again, we recommend when possible. And uh, once this process is completed, uh, you can arrive at the final uh, SDG 11.3.1 indicator. Uh, so for those of you who viewed our prior webinars on uh, SDG 15.3.1 land degradation for SDG 11.3.1, uh, you'll have similar outputs. So there'll be Excel tables summarizing SDG 11.3.1 uh, for these uh, four time periods. So as I mentioned before, uh, the trends.earth tool provides for you pre-computed maps of impervious surface index. What this slide is describing is how we actually uh, derive those maps using Landsat data. Uh, so what we do is we draw on an existing data set, the Global Man-Made Impervious Surface, or GMIS uh, data set, uh, which uh, is a global map of impervious surface area for the year 2010. Uh, you'll see the citation on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. That's our Merrick uh, Brown and Colston et al. What we do is we use that existing data set for 2010 to provide training data in order to develop a random forest model allowing us to map an index of impervious surface area for other time periods. So we use that 2010 GMIS data as training data, uh, drawing on it to provide two different sets of information, training points for uh, what we classify as high quality urban areas. So these are areas in the GMIS data set with high percentage of impervious surface cover, low error, and as a secondary check, uh, we also require that they be mapped as urban areas in the ESA CCI land cover data product. We also then draw a training sample of non-urban areas of high quality, so again, uh, low standard error and a low percentage impervious surface cover in the GMIS data set. And what we do is we train a set of models, uh, of random forest models to map impervious surface area. We noticed pretty early on that we couldn't use a single global model given differences regionally. So what we do is we actually train individual models uh, using a map of terrestrial ecoregions. We train an individual random forest model for each of these ecoregions uh, to allow for regional variations uh, and how we're, uh, the different predictors uh, reflect uh, impervious surface area in each ecoregion. So at the end of the day, we end up with maps for 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015, and 2018 of this impervious surface index. Now, of course, at the end of the day, we don't want a map of impervious surface index. We actually want a map of city extent. Uh, so there's two steps in getting there. Uh, so the first step is converting from this map of impervious surface index to a map of built up area. So the way that we arrive at this map is we draw on some additional data, uh, the nighttime lights index, that impervious surface index that I just mentioned, and then also water frequency using the product from the Joint Research Commission of the EU. And what we provide is what we call the urban mapper. You'll see the address for this website down on the bottom right hand side of your screen. And my colleague Monica will introduce this to you in a moment. 
Uh, but what the urban mapper does, it lets you play around with these three parameters uh, and see in real time how they influence the final map of built up area. So basically, as you increase uh, values of the impervious surface index, uh, that's going to reduce the amount of area that is considered urban because it's essentially thresholding the data. If you require a higher level of impervious surface index to be considered urban, you'll of course be reducing the area that's mapped as urban. Uh, the nighttime lights index uh, uses the nighttime lights data uh, to uh, basically mask out areas of cities uh, that are darker as you increase the value of that index. This is something that makes sense in some contexts, not in others. Of course, some cities uh, will, uh, if you have gridded like power, you'll have uh, higher values in nighttime lights than in other areas that may be uh, more remote. And then the water frequency data set allows you to mask out areas uh, depending on the frequency of water on a given pixel. And again, this is something you can play with on the fly. Uh, Monica will demonstrate in a minute. Uh, and we do provide some recommendations on uh, default values to use uh, for these parameters. So once you've selected values using that urban mapper page, uh, within the trends.earth tool, uh, you can input whatever values you've chosen. You'll see a screen like uh, what you see right now. Uh, these are those same values you saw before, ISI 20, nighttime lights index 10, water frequency 25. And what the tool will use is it will take these parameters and convert from that impervious surface index into a map of built up area. The second step is converting from built up area to urban extent. Uh, so of course, not every area that is built up can be considered necessarily part of a city. Uh, so what we do as a second step is uh, allow the user to input parameters that define how we convert from built up uh, to urban. So what you see here are the default values that are used in the tool. Uh, and these generally will work uh, in the many areas we've looked at, but of course you can alter these values as necessary. Uh, so an urban area is defined as an area with greater than 50% built up within a 500 meter radius uh, of that pixel suburban from 25 to 50, and then rural uh, less than 25%. We also consider open space because of course, many cities will have parks or other open areas within the city that are still considered urban, even though they may not be uh, impervious. And so we define fringe captured in rural open space. Fringe open space are those open spaces uh, within 100 meters of urban and suburban areas captured open space is that open space that is fully surrounded uh, by fringe open space. And then rural open space are basically all other areas uh, outside of the city. Uh, so as before with the conversion from impervious surface index to built up area, there's a screen that defines how built up area is converted to urban. And so what you'll see here are those same parameters I just mentioned. Here the default is set to 25% uh, built up is considered suburban, 50% built up is considered urban. And then we also have an additional parameter uh, defining the area of the largest captured open space in hectares. So what this influences is basically if you can imagine a park in the middle of the city, what's the maximum size that park might be and still be considered to be part of the city uh, and, and not uh, just open space. The final step in the process is defining the area of analysis. Uh, so we provide a number of different options for defining the area. Uh, the first is you can use uh, the data set that we include within the tool uh, to pick a country and region or city on which you wish to focus. This is data provided from the natural earth data set. Uh, we do recommend as with population that if possible, uh, it's much better to use nationally available or locally available uh, information rather than the defaults that we provide because of course uh, spatial data provided by your national statistics office uh, will be what is uh, nationally recognized as opposed to what we provide here which is a publicly available data set so we can't guarantee uh, the accuracy for a given area. Uh, so if you do have uh, information available from a national statistics office you can choose that area from file option on this screen and that would allow you to define your area of analysis using for example a shape file. Uh, if you have picked a uh, point uh, to input your city location, uh, 
you'll probably want to check this apply a buffer option, which will allow you to look at some circular buffer around, for example, a point defining your city. Once this is done, and again, you'll see more examples of this from my colleague in a minute, uh, but once this is done, uh, the tool will produce maps of urban area for 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2015. This is focusing on Kampala and Uganda. This is showing an example of the map for 2000. What you see in red is urban area, orange, suburban, green, open space uh, on the fringe, and then the darker green is captured open space. And of course, the blue uh, is water. If we go through time, this is Kampala in 2005, 2010, and 2015. So you can see the growth of the city extent over time. And then, of course, uh, the final output of the tool, uh, you can see here a map summarizing uh, SDG 11.3.1 uh, from 2000 to 2005, 2005 to 2010, and 2010 to 2015. And you'll also see some information summarizing uh, population uh, within each of the uh, different types of uh, urban extent, so urban, suburban, built up, open space. Uh, so this tool uh, is uh, still undergoing testing. Uh, we've had, of course, uh, support from our partners. Uh, NASA is working to test this tool uh, within the United States using some existing data, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, we're also working closely with UN Habitat uh, with Dennis and his team to test the tool in a number of uh, cities around the world. Uh, we're working with partners in Mexico, Peru, and uh, Colombia uh, as well uh, to test and apply the tool. And just to show you an example of some of the work that we're doing uh, within the United States, this is led by uh, our colleague Lahuri uh, Bonana at uh, NASA. And this is showing for 25 cities uh, in the United States, a uh, comparison of the values for the impervious surface index, nighttime lights, and water frequency that perform best uh, for each of the cities uh, in the US. And this is in part what's been used to guide uh, the default values of these parameters within the tool. So as far as next steps uh, for this work on 11.3.1, uh, as I mentioned before, we're continuing to work with uh, partners such as NASA and UN Habitat uh, on the verification process of this tool and also to provide uh, regional guidelines on the most appropriate parameters to use uh, for different areas of the world. Uh, we have also noticed some issues in hyper-arid regions where it can be difficult uh, to map built-up areas in part due to confusion of uh, impervious surfaces uh, with soil. So that's another area that we're continuing to look at. Uh, we're also in close contact with uh, uh, providers of gridded population data like Season, as I mentioned before, uh, to provide better guidance uh, to users on the most appropriate rather uh, population data sets uh, to use uh, for mapping changes in population growth rate. And then, of course, we're continuing capacity building efforts as well, of course, both through uh, our set uh, as well as through UN Habitat. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to this overview. Uh, of course, this is available within the QGIS plugin, trends.earth. Further information on the methods I just described and on usage of that tool is on the website, http colon slash slash trends.earth. Uh, the third link that you see on your screen is the link uh, to the urban mapper, so that page that helps uh, with selecting uh, the values for the parameters to use uh, in the trends.earth tool. And now to uh, go through this and provide an example of how to actually use the tool to map SDG indicator 11.3.1, I'll hand it over to my colleague uh, Monica Noon, uh, who's Senior Manager of Data Science for Resilience here at Conservation International. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Monica Noon. I'm the Senior Manager of Data Science for Resilience at Conservation International, and I'm going to walk you through a demo of SDG Indicator 11.3.1 um, using the Trends.Earth plugin to QGIS. Um, so again, once you open your QGIS um, software version 2, um, you can check to make sure that you have the plugin visible here. 
Again, if you don't, you can right click and make sure it's checked on. Um, and if not, if you haven't downloaded it yet, um, you can go through the plugins menu um, as demonstrated in session one. So you'll go to the calculate indicators icon. Um, and today we'll be going over this urban change and land consumption indicators. So SDG indicator 11.3.1. Now, by clicking on that, you'll have these two options. Uh, step one will be calculating the urban change. So cl click Calculate Urban Change Spatial Layers. And you'll see this uh, window pop up. Now, we actually have um, a little um, browser-based page that you can use to explore the different parameters. So as Alex explained earlier, um, we have these different impervious surface index, nighttime lights index, water frequency, um, in order to determine where those built up areas are. Um, so what you want to do is click on that from the tool and bring up this um, Earth Engine apps page and uh, zoom in with your mouse to an area of interest. Today I'm going to look at uh, Kampala, Uganda. So we'll zoom in a little bit so we can see roughly where the city extent is. So with those default indicators that I have already in the, the toolbox, um, I can hit Run Analysis, and you can see that this is populating some information here. The reason we have this in the toolbox is so you can play around with these indicators, so you can determine what fits best for your area of interest. Um, I can change this to different values. So for example, if I think that the nighttime lights index is, is not capturing the information correctly, I can change these parameters accordingly. Um, so we have this set as a, a default values. However, um, you have the option to change this to different values and keep hitting run analysis to uh, populate the, the map with, that, um, with those values. Um, I think I'm going to keep those default indicators. So I'll go back. Here I'm selecting 20 for the impervious surface index, 10 for nighttime lights index, and 25 for water frequency. So then I'll hit next. And here you can define um, how you want to define your urban areas. So what percent it will be considered built up and what percent will be considered urban. So I'll leave these again at the default. Suburban is 25%, so all values below this will be considered uh, rural areas. And then 50%, all values below this will be considered suburban. So this is just breaking it into urban, suburban, and rural areas. And also this area of largest captured open space, um, which is 200 meters or sorry, 200 hectares. So the reason that we've actually selected this option um, was, for example, in New York City, there's um, Manhattan has a, a large park called Central Park that many people have visited um, if you go to New York City. Um, however, this is a very massive multi-block park. And when we were early on running this indicator, we were finding that this was being considered a non-urban park. So we decided to add this open space so that includes large um, parks or large natural areas within urban areas. Then we have this population definition, the gridded population of the world, uh, same data set for both of these. Um, I'm going to select the first one, population density consistent with national census and population registers. Then I'm going to go to my country. So I'm going to select Uganda again. Um, just selecting here, um, this first level will then filter the other two. So now that I've selected Uganda, I'll be able to find Kampala, the city of Kampala in their drop down menu. Now this city layer is just a point layer. Um, so if I had a, a, another city layer, maybe the, what I think the extent of my area of interest is, I could upload it here. Um, but since I, I don't really have any information for Kampala, I'm just going to select city, but I'm going to apply a buffer. So I'm going to enter a 20 kilometer buffer because uh, Kampala, if you remember from uh, this map, this actually looks quite large. Um, it, this, point will be somewhere in the city center. So if I want to capture some of these things on the outside, um, I'm going to make it the buffer slightly larger. It will take longer to run as a result. So then I want to type in some information, Kampala, Uganda, SDG 11.3.1. Um, and here I like to type in some notes. So if you've changed these from the defaults, you'll want to add in that information there. So 
impervious surface index, say 20, 10, water frequency, 25. Also, if you've changed these information, suburban, urban, um, open space, you can add that there. Fifty percent. Um, I did a twenty kilometer buffer from that point, um, and then open space. We had twenty, two hundred hectares. So now I'll hit calculate, and again, you'll see this blue bar pop up and notifying that it has been submitted to the Google Earth Engine. So now it's running on uh, Earth Engine cloud servers, and um, we can check our, our download list, again, by going to this, this download results from Earth Engine, hitting refresh, and we can see here my task is now running. Okay, once you're, um, you've refreshed, refreshed your list and you see that the uh, task is completed, you can hit download results. It'll prompt you to save the file, of course. So we're just gonna say Kampala, Uganda. And then 20 kilometers for that 20 kilometer buffer. We'll save that and it's going to load to the map. So now we have urban area change. So this is your change map um, showing built up by 2000, built up by 2005, 2010, 2015, and of course no data in water areas with water. So to get the um, spatial, the final spatial indicator for SDG 11.3.1 and the um, tabular output, we can go back to the calculate indicators and select again urban change and land consumption indicators and then select step two, calculate urban change summary table. So as you can see under input, since I've already uh, run or downloaded that layer, we have the urban change layer already pre-populated. I can select next and save our outputs. Again, I like to select and copy that so I don't have to type it again. Hit next. I'm just going to use these, um, this, the areas that I've already selected. So Uganda, Kampala, again, applying that buffer of 20 kilometers. And I can give the name of final. It's going to calculate this locally. So now we can just let it run. Um, it'll run quickly and it'll give us um, some data layers for each of those time steps, as well as the output table. So here we can see we have urban area for 2015, and it gives us some information. It's a little more detailed than um, that urban change area. So for each year, we have urban change for 2015. For example, we have the urban areas, suburban areas, again, defined by that those uh, percentage uh, parameters in the tool. We have built up rural, we have open space, and these, again, um, are, can be altered by those, those parameters that we entered. And we have a nice little time series if we click on and off all of these. We can see the change over time, which is then um, demonstrated in this final layer. We also have a, a, an ex output Excel uh, table, which has this information as well. Um, so this will be summarized for the indicator that's um, the SDG indicator land consumption rate. Um, to get at the SDG 11.3.1 um, growth rate and land consumption. So here we have the breakdown again of those two time periods from 2000 to 2005, each between each time step, 
how that population change um, has occurred, uh, the growth rate of the city area, the city area change, and then those values are used to calculate land consumption rate, which eventually then leads to this uh, SDG 11.3.1 indicator, um, the actual consumption rate over population. And we have a little chart that also demonstrates that over time. So that is uh, the demonstration of how to run SDG indicator 11.3.1 using trends.earth in QGIS. Thank you. So again, I'd like to thank our guest speakers for being here with us today and providing those really interesting, informative presentations and walking us through the trends.earth uh, tools for sustainable cities. Um, we are going to have some time for questions, but if your question does not get answered or you have a follow-up, you can email myself or my colleague Juan Torres Perez and our email address is shown here. If you have general RSET inquiries, you can email our program manager, Adam, Anna Prados. And again, feel free to check out our RSET website there. We have a lot of different trainings in different application areas, and um, they're all listed there, freely available, ready for you to um, watch the recordings and to um, get the presentations and exercises. So I really would like to thank you all for being here with, with us today. Um, and I want to provide a reminder to complete the homework by August 6th. So that's two weeks from now. Um, and we'll have some time for questions now. But I really hope that this training provided you with um, some new tools and new information about how you can address the SDGs in your work whether it's on a country level or a local level, or you're just wondering about how to get integrated and what data to use and um, what the approaches are. So um, I hope this was an informative training for you all. And um, we hope to continue our work on providing SDG focused trainings with RSA in the future. And I also just wanna remind everyone that we will be following up via email with a survey um, for you all to complete. And these are really, really valuable to us here at RSET. We, we take these to heart. We appreciate your um, constructive criticism on how the training went, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want to see more of in the future. And that's what we really use these surveys for in a lot of ways of identifying the needs in the community and developing our trainings around those needs. So we do really appreciate your uh, participation in those surveys and, and the, your feedback there as well. Um, so thank you again, and we will now open it up for questions. And once again, you can type your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll be displaying them and answering them as we go in the document. And um, we'll, we'll provide that on the website um, at, uh, in a few days as well. So thank you. Uh, again, this is Axel from Conservation International. Uh, what we're going to do here, uh, if Dennis uh, Moniki is still on the line, I think questions one and two would likely be best addressed by you. Um, so I can hand it off to you, uh, Dennis, for questions one and two. Yes. Uh, the question one, could you explain how the relationship materializes between land consumption rate and related growth rate? Uh, as I mentioned for for this for this particular indicator, the you get a value. So the first the, the, the denominator of the indicator would be a value that represents the land consumption rate, which is an annual growth rate of the, or rather is is an annual rate I treat the land is uh, being consumed in that city. Uh, the the denominator would be the rate I treat the population is, uh, is is growing at an annual level in that city. So the the ratio of the two will give you a value that could represent different things. So if, if you have, say, a value that is less than one, it means that uh, for this particular city, then the, the, the population was growing faster than the, the land consumption. So it's, 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 it, it points towards identifying city. 
if a value is more than one, then it means that the land consumption was happening at a faster rate than the population growth rate for that city, and, and, and so on and so forth. So for some cities, uh, you also have some cities which lose their populations or they lose uh, part of the uh, urban area, say, for example, because of a disaster or because uh, of aging population or a shifting population. So for these particular cities, you get a negative uh, value for the indicator. Which uh, which could will, will be based on whether the population was declining or the actual urban uh, area level uh, the settlements actually uh, decreased. So this then uh, this this the interpretation as I mentioned in my other recorded presentation is really very depends on depends on how you how you relate this to the other kind of indicators. The second question is how it how. Uh, the balance is achieved on the two fronts which are mentioned increase forestation and increase urbanization uh i'd like to talk a bit about the increased urbanization and I, i'd assume that the increased forestation means that uh, is the reduced uh, urban sprawl so again this is very relative to the area some cities uh, really require to be densified other cities uh, need to have less a bit of uh, redensification or reduction in the densities and this i i for, for, from a unab perspective is we promote identification but not too much identification which then uh, results in informality in, uh, in in that particular city so so the balance is actually looking at how the indicator values uh, really balance with the other services say for example provision of basic services in that city uh, availability of open spaces in that city and so on and so forth so if you have a city that is sprawling or is uh, growing out was very fast then that is a problem in, in many different fronts uh, and this is a challenge that uh, we are having a lot with many cities where we have a lot of uh, sprawling uh, developments which which eat into other kind of land uses so I think that for me would be the explanation. Alex. Apologies, finding my mute button. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dennis. Um, and then for uh, question three, uh, there's a question on how do you determine in trends daughter the approximate value of the population living within a one square kilometer box, which are the required inputs. Uh, as is noted here already, there are a range of different uh, gridded data sets uh, to estimate population. Uh, some of those include those from CSEN, from JRC, and the European Commission, World Pop, etc. Uh, what's used right now in Trends.Earth is the gridded population of the world, GPWv4. Uh, so that gridded data set, which again is produced by season, is what is used uh, as a default. You can, in the summary table that's produced at the end of the tool, you can input your in own population data if you have it. Uh, and I recommend, of course, listen back to when we discuss this in the webinar. But just briefly, there are some issues assessing uh, population growth rates from gridded population data sets. So for that reason, we do recommend uh, that, if possible, uh, using locally available data that's applicable to the units of analysis that you're focused on is best. Uh, question four, does NASA have a database of geospatial population or demographics? Can it be used for disaster management, for example, evacuation, disaster severity, uh, et cetera? Uh, as noted in the response here uh, from the RSET team, it's best to refer to the CDAC, uh, Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, uh, for demographics information. Uh, and it looks like actually there will be an upcoming webinar as well with a guest speaker talking about remote sensing applications related to disaster uh, risk management. So I'd encourage you to look at those uh, resources uh, that are listed in the response to answer four. Uh, for question five, which NASA slash ESA satellite platforms and instruments are used for measuring NDVI? Uh, so, as noted in the response here, there's different sensors that can be used to assess NDVI. We presented in the last two webinars, uh, primarily focusing on using MODIS data, which is 250 meter resolution to assess uh, trends of productivity over time for this tool for the urban uh, analysis for SDG 11.3.1. We're using 30 meter data uh, from Landsat. And uh, Mariano gonzalez Roglic, uh, who's also here, could add anything there if there's anything you'd want to add. Uh, no, no, like you said, it, for this indicator in particular, what we're using is Landsat. Uh, and you, so what we're doing is a, a time series of NDVI for different years. And you, you can refer to the documentation where it explains 
there's a stack of uh, 20 something bands that we use for each year, but it's the source is, is Lanza, yeah. And then the next question is probably best for you also. Yeah, question number six, what does imperfect surface index mean? And how do you calculate it? So um, the meaning of it, the imperfect surface index, it's, it's an index uh, that ranges between zero and 100 and lower values are more correlated with areas where there's no imperfect surface, so areas with vegetation, with uh, where there's no buildup, uh, human buildup. Uh, and higher values represent areas where there's higher uh, imperfectness. So usually buildings, roads, things are uh, constructed by humans, and also areas with, with rocks. So that, that's also an imperfect surface. That's why then we do need to use this, these different thresholds like nighttime lights or uh, to, to differentiate what is human and what is natural. Uh, how do we calculate it? We used, we, I would recommend that you check the website, Trans.Earth. There's, we have a section that we added yesterday on SDG 11 with a very detailed description of how we computed it. What we did is we used um, the global man-made imperfect surface data set produced by NASA. Um, Eric Brown de Colston was the, the PI of that project. It was um, a product of imperfect surface for 2010. So we used that and ESA uh, CCI land cover data set to train a set of random forest models uh, using Landsat data. So what we we used that model, we trained it for 2010, and then we applied it to a series of years to create the time series. Uh, and again, the step-by-step the -step explanation of all the inputs, the outputs, and the assessments that we did are on the website. So I would recommend that you check it there. Question seven, sorry, I cannot see it here. Sorry. Are there efforts to take sustainability methods such as these and expand it to watershed level as management unit, therefore conserving, creating sustainable area, urban, suburban, agriculture, and wild areas? Um, probably Dennis maybe may, may know more about these. I don't know, Dennis, if you want to add something to these questions, in response to this question. Uh, not from not from our side because uh, we are more focusing on the urban kind of uh, look of things because our, our mandate is also on the urban 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 aspects of uh, human settlements. So, but I think uh, it's uh, the already the, there's a lot of opportunities emerging from the SDGs framework that actually links uh, the urban growth and the different uh, kind of. Uh, uh, land uses like watershed level management. So I think it would be interesting to see maybe within the broader SDGs uh, framework the the in between uh, the, this kind of application and and what is required for the watershed management. Okay, thanks for that, Dennis. Um, question number was question number eight. Yeah. Uh, are all the world countries considering the calculation of urban changes? Um, so yes, we did. Uh, yeah, yes and no. <laughs> we did train the model uh, globally. So we use, like Alex mentioned in the presentation, we use eco regions to train the different sets of models for different regions. We try to run it globally, and it's covering most of the uh, of the cities on Earth. Uh, but there are some areas for which we did not fine training data that had to be with limitations on the original data sets that we used. So again, you're going to see that in, in the website, we posted some maps and some statistics on, on some of the cities for which we, we were not able to generate data, most of them being small island states. So you're going to notice that, that there's many, uh, I think it, it represents a pretty small number. We did an assessment on 224 cities and I think it was less than two or three percent the ones that did not have uh, data. But um, there are some without data. There are some for which the data set has very, it's not really working very well. So that's why it's important that you assess the results uh, for your area. But it's working well for above 85 percent of the, of the cities globally. Uh, and then for question nine. Uh, this is Alex again. How do we export these layers to a TIFF? A trial on the previous exercises leads to a 35-band raster, and it is difficult to identify which band represents which layer. 
Uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, right now, there's a little trick to see what those layers are if you go to the load data tool uh, in trends.earth. That will actually show you the names of each band. Uh, but this is a question we've gotten before. What I will do is I'll try to get this up later today. If you go to our website, uh, trends.earth, I'll add under the documentation section uh, description for each of the outputs uh, with uh, what each band uh, is and how they are coded. Right now, that information is available in the JSON file that accompanies your download, but that's not uh, very accessible. So definitely we'll uh, add more information there, so stay tuned uh, on, for more information on the coding. Uh, question 10 back to Mariana. Perfect. Uh, question 10, I would like to know about the validation process of the urban map. Um, so assessing a data set like this one, it, it's, it's challenging, as you can imagine. And that's why we, we decided to create a, a tool that, that allows the user to really customize the results for the area. That being said, we, we understand that doing validation and assessments are important. And so we did uh, several things. So the, the first one that we did was assess the sort of the error that we were finding between our, our imperfect service data set, the, the 2010 layer, and the one that we use for training. And by comparing those two, we estimated the RMSC, the root mean square error, and the values that we found for the subset of cities where we tested it was around 10%, uh, which, is, which for an index that ranges between zero and 100, it, it's relatively low. So that was sort of the first assessment that we did. Uh, of, of it's not, yes, a determinate number that's gonna say it's good or it's bad, uh, but it pointed us in, a, in the right direction. Then the other assessment that we did is the one I was mentioning that it's now posted on the website uh, where we took pretty much every capital city in the world. Those were 200 data set of 200 cities. Uh, and then we also used uh, an analysis on the largest um, cities in the US that added other, another 24 cities. And what we did is we, we compare the results of the tool to high spatial resolution images to see how how the buildup index matched, how, how, how well it was representing the buildup area in, in these cities. And for that, we did a, it's a subjective evaluation, but we, we ranked it from zero to five, zero meaning no data, five meaning it worked perfectly well, uh, and, and we used that as sort of another assessment. And we posted that on the website so you can see what are the values, and then you can also see for each of the cities for which ones we had good data, for which ones we had bad data, and what are the parameters that we used. Uh, and the third sort of validation verification that we're planning on doing, it's, it's relying on you. Uh, because we do need, we, that there's so much assessment that, that we can do, we really need your input, the users running the tool. So when you go to the, to the tutorial, to the step-by-step -step guide, you're gonna see that at the end, there's gonna be a little box in which we request to, to, for your feedback. So we, we put together a little Google survey, so at the end of the tutorial you can click. It takes 30 seconds to fill, but what we're asking there is what are the parameters that you used for which city, and then what is your assessment of that result? Was it totally useless and, and it didn't provide any information? Uh, again, using that same scale from zero to five, zero being very bad to uh, five being perfect. So I think that is going to really inform us uh, on on the quality and the usefulness of this data set for really assessing the SDG. So sorry, that was a long answer, but we, we do really are trying to produce a product that is validated, verified, but it, it's sort of challenging with a global data set combining so many different things. Uh, for question 11, how can we import our own population data? It depends on what you mean. If uh, you've noticed in the final output of the summary table that's produced for SDG 11.3.1, if you scroll down in the Excel sheet, there's a table of population. You can replace those numbers and the Excel sheet will recalculate the SDG 11.3.1 indicator. So that is one way you can replace the gridded population data we provide with your own population data. If you're talking about importing a gridded population data set that you have uh, that's a different data set, right now that's not supported uh, directly within trends.earth, but we'll definitely uh, add that to the list of uh, requests for uh, future, 
features. Okay, back yeah. to Mario. Back to next. Twelve. Question 12, there's two parts here. The first one is how well does Lanza pick up vertical buildup in a, on the interior of cities, such as skyscrapers, high-rise buildings, and the answer is how well? Not well at all. Uh, with Landsat, what you're doing is, is picking up the sort of the footprint of the build-up area. So you cannot differentiate between a house and a skyscraper. Skyscraper, sorry. Um, so we, that's why what we're measuring is build-up area. We're not really assessing sort of the, the, the volume of the city in terms of, of how high the buildings are. Uh, and then the second question is how to distinguish build-up areas from bare lands. Uh, in arid and semi-arid using Landsat data. Uh, there's two things here that we're doing. First is um, build-up areas have a very constant signature throughout the year. So it doesn't really change with, with the uh, throughout the seasons. It's, it's always in purpose. So the reflectance, it, it's pretty constant. Uh, areas where there's um, bare, bare lands, it's bare, but there there is some vegetation or some changes in humidity when it rains, or so there is some some variability throughout the year. So we're trying to capture those two different characteristics of these two surfaces by using um, statistics of of the time series of of the reflectance over time. So we're using the median of the of each of the bands and then of a series of indices, but also we're including variability over the time. So a build-up area is very constant, but it, while in, in soil or bare areas, there, there may be some flexibility, when, but some variability when it rains and when, when a few grasses uh, grow up. Uh, so that is when we're building the model and when we're training uh, the random forest model. And then at the end, the, the last sort of control that we do for that is what you're doing in the urban mapper is using nine time lights. So that is sort of the, the final control that you can do to differentiate between these two types of, uh, of areas. You, you're going to notice that if you only use impervious servers, the, the top of mountains, which are rocky, are going to come up as, as build-up. But these areas have no lights, usually, because there's no people living there. So we're using nighttime lights to, to mask those out and, and just focus the analysis on the cities. Um, one last key point is that you're not going to find one set of parameters that is going to work for your for the globe, not even for your country. So it's important that you run these analyses at the city scale. So you need to look at the parameters, zoom to the city, like Monique explained in the, in the example, um, and then define the parameters that work well in that area. If you have a mountain 100 miles away, well, it, it may not work well there, but you should be running the analysis on the city boundary. So. And one thing I would add related to that uh, is, uh, so some of you may have noticed there's a new version of the tool, QGIS uh, plugin uh, version 0.66. Uh, if you're using the new version of the tool, you might notice a message pop up uh, if you try to run a very large area for the urban analysis. And this is related to what Mariano was just saying, is that we do recommend that you run this analysis at the city scale. Uh, and there will be a message that pops up if you're here. The area that you specify is greater than 10,000 square kilometers. Is that right, Moreno? Uh, sorry, we're the question. Sorry, for <laughs> SDGL 1.3.1, it's 10,000 square yeah, kilometers. Yeah, it's 100 by 100. Yeah, uh, 100 by 100 uh, kilometers. Um, so you may notice that message popping up if you have the new version of QJS. With the older versions, you won't get that message, but your task uh, will likely still fail if you try to run a very large area. So if you do try to run the urban tool and you see a task failing, it's likely that you're trying to run a very large area. So try to run a smaller area. And of course, we recommend upgrading to the new version of the plugin, which will automatically detect that for you. Uh, and then for question 13, when defining urban pixels, do you define a 500 meter buffer or 564 meters to correspond to one square kilometer area? I believe. So in the tool, we're, we're using the 500 meter buffer. Yes. Uh, I don't, yeah. We're, Is that a like, projection? Yeah, I, I don't know where this number is. The, the 560. Well, because 500 meter buffer wouldn't be. Uh, yeah. Once 
so I guess the question is, is it one square kilometer area or is it 500? No, it's a 500 meter yeah. buffer that we're doing, yeah, a round of each pixel. That's how we, yeah, how we code it in the tool, yeah. Uh, question 14, how, uh, how are the year, yearly Lanza stacks created? Are you using all available scenes, maybe depending on cloud coverage? Are the certain months preferred, chosen for specific regions? That's a great point. Um, so what we're doing is, we're, the time series that we're creating is, it starts in 1998. Um, so we're producing a stack for 1998, one for 2000, one for 2005, 10, 15, and 2018. Uh, for each of those years, uh, yes, there we, we do filter for, of course, for cloud coverage and, and, and quality of the images. So each of the images, we don't filter the images. What we do is we remove the clouds and we use all the useful information that it, each Landsat scene has. Um, in many areas, especially in for the earlier years, for 1988 and 2000, uh, image availability is a, is a serious limiting factor. So we, what we had to do was to use for each year, so what we call, for example, 2000 is actually combining 1999, 2000, and 2001. So we're using information from the year prior and from the year after uh, of the, the name of, of that, how we call that year. Um, so we're, yeah, filtering, masking, and we're using images, the last point, for throughout the year. So it's all the all the image available, all the images available, and like I said, we we have different ways uh, of summarizing them. For some, we we use the median, so it's a measure of sort of centrality within the the, the year variability. And for others, we use the we also we included median, and we also included uh, standard deviation as a measure of the variability to be able to capture pixels that were uh, constant over time and like the ones that are built up and air pixels that were changing in terms of reflectance, uh, which usually are associated with more natural land covers. And then for question 15 relates to Liberia, I haven't worked there, but Monica has, so I'll pass over to Monica. Thanks, Alex. Um, so in the last Q&A session, you mentioned that you have operated in Liberia um, and other Eastern African countries. Um, what's our answer? Oh, yeah. Um, please, under which ministry or office institution can I connect with your activities? I'm currently living in Liberia and would love to connect um, in any capacity. So, um, first of all, we actually have a Conservation International office in Liberia, um, and we have a, a, a GIS analyst based out of there as well. Um, in, I guess, March of 2018, when we held the, tra the capacity training um, workshops with UNCCD, um, we had a member from the, the Ministry of Environment um, as the GIS expert at that workshop. So um, we've worked pretty closely with him in the past, uh, over the past year and a half. Um, and he's been using the tools for different purposes. Um, so you can just email us, um, I guess, directly at trends.earthatconservation.org and we can connect you um, to our colleagues in Liberia. Thanks, Monica. I'll, question 16, why is random forest select, the selected algorithm instead of another AI algorithm? Um, we use random forest, the, the, there are others which uh, probably could have been used. Random forest has been proven to be successful for this type of analysis, so that's where we went with it. Uh, and also, I guess one other thing is that we, we're running this analysis in Google Earth Engine, and random forest is one of the models available. So. I guess the combination of it's one of the best models available and it's the one we, we had access to. But if someone has other suggestions of other models that would be more appropriate, I, please reach out and we, yeah, we, we're constantly trying to improve the, the data set so we, we can definitely test other things. Uh, question 17, you want to go for it? Uh, sure. Uh, when selecting the population definition, we have two options. Which one is higher, or sorry, which one is higher in general? which one is optimal for analysis. So what this is referring to is in the urban indicator calculation, you can choose between the UN corrected uh, population statistics or those uh, that are consistent with national estimates. Uh, I wouldn't say that either is going to be generally higher. Uh, it's going to depend on 
the country uh, that you're looking at and which one to choose is really more a question of what it is you're doing with uh, the data. Typically for most users that we've worked with, if you're working in a government ministry, you're going to want to use something that matches your national statistics. So that may be the preferred choice, uh, but there's not one that is generally uh, preferred. Yeah. Question 18, is there a way to use watershed boundaries for the buffer instead of a circular buffer? Um, yes, we, we do not have watersheds preloaded in the in the toolbox, but you can use your watershed uh, watershed shape file or just polygon in the tool. So you in that same window where you define the study area, you can uh, use the your own watershed file to run the analysis on that. Um, again, uh, we do have that limitation of 100 by 100 kilometer area. So if your watershed is, is too big, you're not going to be able to run it. But if it's a watershed that it's circumscribed to the city, it, it will work fine. Um, question 19, is the model compatible with tropical countries? We also have a very heterogeneous land cover plus bad zoning practice, hence my question. Um, the model in terms of the impervious surface model I imagine is the, the question is referring to. Um, you're going to notice again in, in the when you check the verification, the sort of that, that assessment that we did in, in 224 cities, that uh, it works pretty well in tropical countries for most of them. There are some regions though where cloud uh, coverage combined with low um, sort of a, a small archive of Landsat images then the model in, in some of these areas, it's not performing very well. Uh, but for most tropical areas, it, it, it works great. Yeah. So I would say, again, uh, you're going to notice this very well when you start testing the, the Google Mapper for your city. You're going to see that for a few cities, um, if the image availability is very low, you're going to see that the results look or striped or, or it's not really capturing well uh, where the urban area is, where the build-up area is. Question 20, is there a general rule of rule or method for determining the threshold for the different indices, imperfect surface, nighttime lights? Because for example, we can be two person working about the same region but choosing different values. It will impact will it impact the calculations? So that's the first question. Um, for that one, um, we do we do not have a, a set of recommended values that you can use. Uh, what we did is we provide there what we consider were the best values for, for the different regions. Uh, but it, it's true that if, if two different people with different criteria would, would run the analysis and they choose different parameters, the results would vary. Uh, they wouldn't vary greatly because if you use 5% more or 5% less, it means your, your build-up area would increase a little bit more or less but the trends in the in the SDG 11 would not significantly change. So it's a matter of uh, sort of what the objective of the analysis is. If, if you're if you're what you're trying to get is the actual build-up area, then those numbers will vary. If you're interested more in the trend on the SDG, so how how the sustainability of the city is, is trending, then that would not be affected very much. The second part of the question um, is. Is there a graded population data? Does the graded population data exist for Morocco? If we can export urban layers to use it for another analysis. So the graded population data, uh, yes, exist for Morocco. These are global data sets, so you, you, you can check those. How good they are, though, it will depend on, on the data provided to build the model. So again, it's one of the things where global data sets has its limitations, but, but the data is global. Then how can the layers be exported for other analysis? All the layers that we produce in Transit Earth are GeoTIFFs. So you can use uh, all the results that you download. Can you, you can use them in, in any other uh, GIS software. So it's a matter uh, of, yeah, just download the results and then they can be loaded in any other GIS. For question 21st, I think Dennis would be more fitted to answer this question is, what is the basis for defining the percentage of urban and suburban? Yes, uh, so for, for this one too, we are using the approach called the uh, a city urban extent approach to city definition. 
And uh, what we look at is, is uh, within every one square kilometer of uh, a, a pixel, around, around each built up pixel, we look at how many other pixels are actually built up. So if 50% uh, and above of the, of the surrounding pixels are built up, then that area qualifies to be an urban area. Then if it's uh, between 25 to 50% of uh, surrounding built up pixels, then uh, that, that, that area is an urban uh, area. Thanks, Dennis, for that. Um, and, and in the tool, remember that these parameters uh, can be changed. So um, we, we're following sort of those, those guidelines, but you, you can customize those. Question 22nd, is there any evidence to use only one year before and after the EMIR to deal with the data? Um, so our approach, what we're trying to do here is ideally would like to use only images for the, the target year. Uh, so we started with that, and that's how we realized that there was uh, not, not enough data in many regions. Uh, as you can imagine, developed countries, uh, well, especially in the US, uh, the Landsat Archive is, is huge, and it's pretty much every image has been recorded and stored. So it, it's, it's a compromise. We, we started with just the target year, and then we were slowly increasing the time year period. Our, I, our uh, goal was to make it as the, that window as narrow as possible, but have data for most places. So it was, it was more of a of a compromise between uh, the ideal and the data availability. Uh, question twenty third: How long should the processing take? I submitted a job and it's still running after twenty minutes. Yeah. Uh, that is a great question. Uh, it depends on the size of the area that you're running it on. Usually the test that we have been running takes a, about 30, 40 minutes to run. And that being said, uh, we're running this analysis, remember, on Google Earth Engine. Uh, and there is, the, there is a, when a lot of tasks are submitted, some of the tasks are taking longer. So I imagine that right now, since all of, of us are submitting tasks and testing things, the analysis may take a little bit longer. Uh, so I would say have a, a bit of patience. Um, but as long as you don't get a, a, a failed message, uh, you, you're going to be fine. Uh, even if, if, if it seems like waiting for an hour is a long time, uh, we, we did discuss this with you and Habitat and with our NASA colleagues. Uh, and it's, it's an hour of waiting, but it, this analysis, if you had to download the data, do the pre-processing, and do all the analysis, you're talking about weeks of work. So even if it takes a little bit uh, of time, uh, don't, don't get frustrated. You, you can get a, ha have a coffee in the meantime. We're, we're giving you some time to take a break. Um, oh, before you move to move on, um, I also just want to remind you um, that if you have that download window open, it's not going to automatically refresh when the results are done. So make sure you hit that um, refresh. refresh results. Um, in the downloads window or refresh list. So it may actually already be done as well. So um, just hit refresh list every time so you get the latest. Perfect. I cannot see the questions here. Question 24. The urban area mainly mixed with sand, bare, land, rock, outcrop. So how to improve the classification for urban extraction? While working at regional level, build up are mixed with these land features. Um, are you, well, I would like to, to hear Mac back for this person. Maybe if you, if you could send us an email with the area where you're running it and the parameters, then, then we could definitely uh, provide a, a response that is going to be more useful. Uh, yes, there are some areas where these, these mix-ups are happening, like, like we explained. Uh, for more, most of the areas, it's not. Uh, if, if for the areas, if you find an area where this, this is happening, uh, but you think that the, the overall data set is providing insights, uh, you could download the results and then do some, some cleaning up on, on a GIS software. You could do it in, in QGIS. Um, but yeah, it would be useful to know what is the area where you're testing it and the parameters, and then we can give you a more informed response, a more useful. And I think that's all the 
questions, uh, unless there's any others coming in. Um, I guess I'll get there one more second, but otherwise, in the meantime, I also wanted to mention, uh, I'm sure, of course, there may be questions about uh, the methods, the tool, et cetera, after uh, the webinars are finished. Uh, we do have an email listserv. If you go to trends.earth on the homepage, scroll down to more information, and you'll see a link that says join the trends.earth discussion group. So that's a Google group where if you have any questions about the methods, about the tool, you can feel free to send an email to that list and one of us or someone else in the community of users can get back uh, to your questions. So feel free to contact that group uh, with any questions and we encourage you to join. And I think that's it for the questions. So uh, thank you from all of us here at Conservation International and uh, we'll hand back over to our set. Great. Thank you all. And um, we really appreciate you staying on and answering these questions. It was a really great discussion. Um, so just a few reminders before we close down for this um, training series. Um, we have included a link to um, a survey, um, or we will email you the, a link to a survey about this training. and. We really appreciate you all um, taking the time to go through and answer those questions. Tell us what you liked, tell us what you didn't like, and really tell us what you'd like to see in the future, because we use these survey responses to develop our training materials um, and plan for future trainings. So we, we love to hear that feedback from you all. Um, also, if you want to provide information in that survey about how you are working with the SDGs, or if you'd like to see more trainings focused on SDGs, please let us know. Um, also, if you would like to receive a certificate of completion, please do remember to complete the homework um, by two weeks from now, August 6th. And the link to the homework is on the training webpage as well, and it's, it's a Google form that, that you submit this way. And um, do please be patient with the, the certificates. They take about two months to send out to everyone. So after um, you've completed the, um, the homework there. So um, again, we'll have the answers to the um, questions and the recording posted to the training website um, within a few days, maybe about a week. Um, and so do please come back to that and revisit it as needed. Um, and then do take advantage of the uh, listserv and the trends.earth group for any questions that you may have along the way. So thank you all so much. And um, we really enjoyed this, this webinar series and um, have a great day.